I'd like to say to all of the young innovators, Black Lives Matter. could nonviolent action be used against ISIS? You Even can the be a of part of, of the biggest scientific time. discoveries of our time. My name is Teresa Rayford. I'm uh, the lead organizer and founder of Don't Shoot Portland, which is a Black Lives Matter movement here in Oregon. Uh, we're extremely active. We've been protesting since August of 2014. My, my talk today is going to be in reference to a meeting that I had. It's an open letter to Michelle Obama. And one of the things that I realized today was that a trending topic on, on Twitter today is farewell, Obama. And another trending topic on Twitter today is SS in reference to the Nazi uh, symbols. And so I think our talk is really relative. Um, it's unbelievable that I get to do this right before their departure from the White House and before the, um, the imposing or the imploding uh, presidential elect Trump takes office. So in 2013, I visited the White House. At that visit, it was the weekend of the State of the Union address, and I was out there with members of families from Sandy Hook, from Clackamas Town Center, from the Trayvon Martin Foundation, and even the family of this little girl named Hydea, who had just previously performed for the president at his inauguration. Um, she had been murdered in her community right after her performance for the president. And I couldn't understand why I was there with all of these families. I was thinking, whatever they have for us is going to be very empowering for my community, so I better make sure that I take this trip and I go out here. And when I got out there, I realized they knew more about me than I had shared. They knew that I had family members that had been murdered by police. Uh, they knew that my family had a situation with possums being dropped off at our restaurant as an intimidation tactic against us because we were a black-owned business. Uh, they knew that my cousin Forrest had been murdered by a, an informant. And they also knew that my nephew died in community gun violence. When I asked Michelle Obama you know, I didn't want to go back to my community and not have what I thought that I came for, which was a plan. I, my hashtag for that whole weekend was demand a plan. And I was out there as a member of Every Town, which was a gun rights organization. And some of the things that they were saying were not the same things that I was saying. They wanted to restrict certain opportunities, but I wanted to change different policies. I found out pretty early that in my community, people could come through our neighborhoods and they could you know, open up their trunk. And based on our state constitution, our state laws, uh, they were able to open the trunk and sell up to 25 guns in a community that was rigged with violence and poverty without asking questions, without a background check. Because the only time you had to go through a background check or anything like that was at a gun show or at a dealer. But if you were just selling guns in the parking lot of Safeway, then it was approved. It was not illegal. I thought that was a hustle. I thought it was an, in, a, an illegal action as I grew up watching that. And I knew that because we had that, that connected access that no one's asking if this person's going to use the gun to kill their wife or their children or the person that they might have an issue with. So when I got there, I asked her, what should we do in our community? What can I take back from this meeting? And she promptly told me that I needed to connect with our faith-based organizations, I needed to connect with our political leaders, I probably needed to run for office, but I needed to connect with people that had political power so that I could use the motivation of the movement that I was there for um, in order to empower them, to create influence. And I thought to myself, well, my nephew got killed in 2010, and I'm an activist now, I'm an advocate. So you have to understand that the first thing I did was I went to those elected officials. I went to the pastors in my community. I even ran for office by the time I had went to the White House. Um, and I didn't get the connected resources from those leaders in our community. I didn't get access to creating any kind of influence for them or for anybody else that had the power to write language that would create policies that would keep our community safe. And I thought to myself, if that's what she thinks is going to work for us, then I'm leaving here without any power. And so I told her that that was a challenge. And she said, well, this is the thing. I've never met the First Lady of the United States. And so for whatever reason that you're here, that's power. It took power to get here. 
It took power for people to recognize that you're doing something in your community that matters. And so that's what you take back to your community. You use this opportunity as an opportunity to get credibility and respect, and you challenge them to be motivated to use that to influence policy. And then I came back home. I came back home, and none of the major newspapers reported that I went to Washington, D.C., and that I was out there standing on the front line with families from Sandy Hook and Clackamas Town Center. One newspaper, The Scanner, a local newspaper, published it, and then another newspaper in France published it, and we had all of the CNN and Washington Post blogs that were national, but that media coverage didn't come to my state, not even to my city, and I was from my city. So the next thing that I did was I started organizing community events, workshops, uh, politically challenging educational opportunities. I wanted to educate people on how to lobby their legislators and their state representatives, because a lot of those groups that had that opportunity, they didn't come to us and say, hey, how can we help you? They were afraid of what I was saying because it hadn't been vetted. And so I taught people how to speak unvetted. I spoke at several universities about the root causes of community violence because we don't want to point fingers at people. We want to talk about what is the root cause of violence, what is the root cause of, of suicide, of murder, of hunger, of illiteracy. Because in my thought, all poverty is a form of violence. And if we're living in an impoverished world and we feel like we have no access to the things that we need in order to be more powerful or more healthy, then we're dying. And what could we do about that besides talk to people that are going to college, that are going to be our future leaders, our future judges, our future politicians? And so I made that my work, and I even got to say fuck the police at a university on my T-shirt. <laughs> I've had clashes with the police during peaceful protests. I promote nonviolent direct action as an activist because a lot of the people that come out to activate with me are grandparents and children children who have lost their parents, uh, grandparents who have inherited the children who have lost their parents, family members of victims, survivors. Um, those are the people that come out there. We don't have military guys. We do have veterans for peace that keep us safe. But we don't have a lot of big, bad guys that protect us. A lot of the people that come out on the front lines with me, they're hurt. Some people are even disabled, but we stand together so that we can show solidarity. And the police still show up at our protests. Uh, my, my voice, my motivation, my movement, even without the support of local leaders and politicians and government, and without me being able to win a seat in office, um, I've been able to challenge the opportunity to speak alongside of Black Lives Matter activists across the world in Chicago last year for Fourth of July. I sat on a panel called Another 28 Hours, The New Jim Crow, and I got to meet amazing people from around the world. And just meeting those people in those spaces, it made our message bigger and wider, and we found more solidarity in that. This is my family's issue, the dead possums. It was an intimidation that created a different opportunity for us to have police safety in our communities. I realized that as a protester, I thought I had rights. I thought that I had a constitutional right to protest. But because I was protesting against violence and brutality, and I lived in poverty, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to do it without resistance. I met Mary Lee Evers, and she was at Temple Beth Israel for Martin Luther King Day. She was the widow of Megger Evers, who was killed back in the day. He was an NAACP member. Um, our family, the Mazik family in Mississippi, we started the Megger Evers Foundation after his death. But when I met her, I met her here in Portland. And this is 50-plus years after he died, and when she spoke as the keynote at that event, she was speaking directly to me. And again, here's that two degrees of separation. I was able to find out, like, she spoke at the inauguration for President Obama. She lost a husband in the civil rights movement. I'm going to speak to her. And when I spoke to her, I just whispered in her ear, Mazik, and she knew the relativity of my protest, even without me understanding it. It's very important, even if you think that people don't understand what you're talking about, even if they don't respect it, you have to do this. You have to move. You have to make change. You have to fight for it. Because any speaking out against these things, any time you go to sit in front of your city commissioners or your legislators, it's necessary. You can't just protest without political action. 
These are our demands. We want to stop being targeted. And this is how we win. We fight back. Black Lives Matter.